Welcome, everybody. We are so excited to have you to join us for today's webinar. Today's topic is why teens use. We're going to talk about parenting principles for understanding with special guest Travis Lynn. I'm very excited to have with us. This webinar is part of a free monthly learning series. It's presented in partnership by Dakota Medical Foundation, Level Up Fargo, and the Maddo Foundation. And together, we're working to delay, decrease, and defeat substance abuse and addiction. So this series is held the first Thursday of every month at noon. So you want to mark your calendars first Thursday, every month at noon. And it features local experts to address youth substance abuse, the challenge young people face, and how you can best support them in reaching their full potential. So whether you're a parent, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, or a caring adult in this community, this series is for you. And be sure to follow Level Up Fargo and Matto Foundation on Facebook for upcoming webinar announcements. And so so we're going to move right to our guest and, and just get right into it, Travis. We're, we're so grateful to, to have you with. And just a, by way of short introduction, um, Travis uh, Lynn is the lead pastor of Relevant Life Church. Uh, he's the founder there. Um, he is known for an outgoing personality. He's a no-nonsense guy. All of us around him just enjoy his presence and being with him. He struggled with addiction as a teen. We're going to talk about his personal story and his experience at Teen Challenge and how he lived his life now and how he helps people and why he went through what he went through to arrive where he is now, where he's helping a lot of people. He's a, a, a committed father and husband, and he's got four children. So he's got a lot to share with us. Travis, thank you so much for joining us today. Man, thanks for having me. It's, it's really an honor. I, this is like one of my favorite places to come. I always grow. I always get better. And so this is definitely a topic that I'm passionate about, and I'm just glad that you guys would invite me here. Well, we're really excited to hear what you have to say, and I, I know we're all going to uh, learn a whole bunch, and we're going to go on a journey with you. And I, I do want to remind those that are watching live is you can type your questions in the chat, and um, we will ask those. So uh, feel free to ask questions as um, we walk through Travis's story and hear some of his advice about working with youth and substance abuse. And so, Travis, let's start with, uh, can you take us to, to where your story kind of begins around addiction in your teen years. Can you tell us just a little bit about your background and kind of the point where you knew you were starting to struggle? Yeah, well, I think today we're going to see a theme uh, in sharing about addiction. For me, some of my addiction, why I used, and we're going to get to some of that, I, I really think it started early, early in my life. Some of the things that happened in my life, so I'm going to back up and share about my story, some of my parents' story. Uh, I grew up in Texas and was born in East Texas. My mom and my biological dad married. My dad got home from Vietnam. He was in, he served two tours in Vietnam and was a military police there. And then he also was a, um, when he got home from, from Vietnam, after my mom and him got married, he was a police officer. And so he was a, a, a police officer at a lake in East Texas. And shortly after my mom and dad got married, they, my mom realized that my dad had some pretty severe uh, complications from being in war. And so this was right around the time that people started understanding what post-traumatic st stress disorder was. And, and so he was suffering for that and having pretty severe flashbacks. And one of those flashbacks included me um, as a child. My dad took me into a room. He had a gun. He was convinced that the Viet Cong was coming. And, um, you know, that freaked my mom out, rightly so, and freaked me out. I don't remember a lot of that. But um, I do, here's what I do remember. My mom and my dad divorced. My mom had him committed to get some help and just really didn't feel like this was something that she could deal with, you know, that she wanted to be in our family, in our life. And so she chose to make that decision. And I didn't see my dad again for at least a decade. And that's what I remember. I re really remember like having this dad in my life and, and this connection with my father and then not and having that longing for that. And I do now after being adult and working through some trauma, I realized that was a pretty traumatic um, 
thing that happened in my childhood. My mom shortly remarried to my stepdad. My stepdad raised me and like big, my mom, I know we'll watch this later, big hats off to my mom and my stepdad for just stepping up and, and raising me. But as a kid, um, I started having these beliefs and these thoughts about myself, about life, about a um, connection, about people. And I had a lot of uncertainty and I had a lot of insecurity. And I remember even as a kid, and I didn't know at the time, but I really was struggling with depression. I was struggling with like, for some reason, and this is something that kids that have have parents that get divorced, for some reason, I couldn't get this idea out of my mind that it was my fault that my parents got a divorce. Um, and also the thought of, if I'm so important or so significant, then where's my dad? Like, where is he? Like, where? And I remember asking my mom, we'd go to bed. I had a stepdad. We had a house. We had all of our physical needs were met. Like, um, we had a good, good life. Um, not to say that our family was perfect. We definitely had issues that we had to work through. But all of my needs, my physical needs were met but I had some really massive emotional needs that my mom and stepdad had no idea how to navigate through and, and neither did I. And so I remember thinking though, and like, if I'm so important and I'm so significant, then where is he? Why isn't he present in my life? And, and so that was some of like, just as at an early age, I started really doubting myself. I doubted my worth, my value. Um, and as a teenager, I started, I started using the first time I used alcohol, I was 12. The first time I got drunk, I was 13, 14. And I realized like right away that it, it kind of calmed like the storm that was raging in my heart. And I had been my, I'd been to doctors and counselors and in my teen years, I went to three different rehabilitation programs. I overdosed uh, twice and almost died. One of those times uh, was airlifted uh, from East Texas to D the Dallas hospital because of how severe my overdose was. Um, tempted suicide um, during that season too. And man, just really struggled with, you know, and I didn't, going back to like 12, 13, I didn't like just like jump right into getting that far. It was like, once I realized though, that when I used, I didn't have to think about myself. I didn't have to think about my parents. I didn't have to think about my situation. I didn't have to think about that rejection or that loneliness that I was feeling. And it was like, now I know I was self-medicating. Like I was trying to escape my reality. And you wouldn't think like you're 13, you're 12, you're 14. Like, what kind of reality do you need to escape? But that's where I was at. And so that really led to once I started. And I remember too, like when I was using, some of my friends would use and they would just do it socially. Um, but I was drinking alone. I was getting high alone. Um, and I remember having the thought of I'm doing this for a different reason then some of my friends were just experimenting or peer pressure or, you know, they wanted the social experience or it's cool. Like we saw this on a movie and we want to do it. Um, and I do think that sometimes that's one of the misconceptions about addiction is like that it's always about your peer group or your, and I'm, I'm not saying like 100% we have to pay attention to the friends that our kids have um, bad company corrupts, good morals, 100% not disagreeing with that but that wasn't the greatest factor to why I used. It might've been where some of that was introduced or it might've been where I got more access to that, but I used uh, primarily because I was really hurting. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, you know, that really escalated um, because once I realized that this kind of silenced the storm that was inside of me, I tried to start using every day. And some people will be like, well, what was your drug of choice? Whatever I could get my hands on, you know, whatever, whatever I could 
use. And so drinking drugs, alcohol, um, almost every hard substance, um, major drug you can think of. I, I experienced that and, and man, I, I kind of maintained it for a season of time. I was actually an honor student all the way to my senior year of high school. And then everything collapsed. Um, I got arrested for a crime that I committed and had the choice to go to either prison or teen challenge, a program called teen challenge. And, and I chose to go to teen challenge. My mom, shout out to my mom, my mom and my, my dad found this program. Um, they actually called social services and said, what's the most successful drug program. And they, this was in Colorado, they called them and my mom and social services said, you got to get them to teen challenge. And so, and that's kind of where my life started to change. Well, you know, I think uh, there's some real key things maybe for us to to dive into before we um, start looking at the pivotal moment of change, which is uh, not knowing what was going on. You know, when you're an adolescent and, you know, we got all sorts of people that are watching today, but, you know, when you go back to that point and now you've done all this self-reflection and this right. storm that was, you know, and, and you work with a lot of youth, but you know, you've done something really great for a lot of us, which is you've illustrated the why. Yep. And so can you take us a, a little bit deeper on, you know, that storm and what that felt like and what you see that in other youth that you worked with? Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think that when you're in that situation, like when you're a kid or you're a teenager, you don't know the why. Like I didn't know at that time that like, my pain was like driving me to make poor choices. Um, and I was reading and I, I was reading about some research about like adolescents and how they think. And there's a part of like the, how they make decisions in, in where, and they use the illustration of the gas and, and the brakes and the gas is full throttle the 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 way that you make decisions like usually like the gas is full throttle and they don't know how to use the brakes you know like that that part in your in your brain that helps you stop or say no i'm not you know that's why you think about teens getting in i'm one of my sons is learning how to drive and he's already gotten to two accidents you know um like because the, the gas is more fun than the break, you know? And, and that was kind of, you know, where it was just like, there wasn't a lot of thought of the repercussions or the consequences. Um, it was more of just like, man, I'm just trying to deal with the moment and I'm just trying to deal. And there was a lot of chaos in my teen years between my, my, my dad, my biological dad was, reintroduced to me that brought tons of chaos there was conflict with my my sister who now we found out is she has schizophrenia um there was a there was tons of like drama in our house and some of it we didn't we were just trying to like get through it and so like the thought of and now i i have we have two foster sons now as well and we'll get ahead to like where i'm at now but but i'm seeing this in their lives like when you are in a situation where like you have emotional turmoil or you have, you know, mental issues, you're not thinking like, how can I get a great GPA in high school? Like you're thinking about, and that's these kids that were entrusted in our care. They weren't thinking about like, how can I crush it in school? They were thinking like for them, and I didn't have this same issue it, for them it was like, where am I going to eat? Or is my home going to be safe? Or, um, you know, and so, so many times I think when it coming back to, cause you asked about the why, um, there was another kind of pivotal point in my childhood or in my adolescent years that I think is really important because in one of the rehab places that I went, this hospital that I went to, this doctor I met was, it was a psychologist. I had never met him before. Um, I'd been in this place for two weeks and gone through the, the like group therapy and, and he'd read my file and we were taking this walk again, the first time I had ever met him and about 15 minutes into this conversation, he looks at me and he says, you are an addict. And I was like, duh, you know, like, that's why I'm here. Um, and he's like, uh, you are going to struggle 
with this addiction the rest of your life. You, we are, we have family history of addiction. Um, and, and so he, and, it, and I remember like, it was like, like a sentence over me. Like, I just remember thinking like, dude, you don't even know me. Like, how are you going to like, and again, it kind of like fed that rejection and it fed that like, um, kind of made me want to rebel honestly, even more. Cause I was just like, you don't even taking the time to get to know me. You're reading my file. You're looking at, and I think that we have to be careful because I know there's a lot of helping professionals on this call. Like I am a massive proponent of counseling and there's multiple, like addiction isn't just one layer. There's multiple layers. There's multiple things that we have to address. Um, but it's really important. I think for me, like, like I don't think we should be labeling 12 year olds, 13 year olds, 14 year olds and, and pronouncing these things on them because what he said, this is what he said about it. You're going to have to learn skills to cope with your addiction. And to me, it was like, now I'm fast forward. It was like, didn't talk to me about my identity. Didn't talk to me about acceptance. Didn't talk to me about love. I mean, and of course we were trying to deal through some of these other things, but he wasn't, there wasn't like any like inner thing. It was just like, here's, here's your addiction, deal with it. And, and now as an adult, I look back and I'm like, dude, if, if I, I would never want to, if my kids, you know, ever struggled with that or, you know, because of my history, of course I talk to my kids and say, look, yeah, you have, you have family history in this and you have to be aware of this, but that's not my focus. Like that's not my focus in parenting. My kids is don't do drugs. My focus is, is to connect, to love, to empower, to equip them. And we can, we're going to talk about like some of those principles later. Um, you know, and so for me, I think that, that one of those pivotal points are, are like the why, even, even when we were trying to address the mess, so to speak, as a teenager, I just was like, I wasn't buying what people were selling me as far as like, until I, until I came to Teen Challenge. Um, I wasn't buying this, this idea of you're the problem, only you. And, and I'm not saying that I didn't need to take responsibility because I was completely making bad choices, but I didn't like come out of the womb as a drug addict. You know, there were a lot of things that led to that moment in my life. And so when we talk about why teens use, I do think that you really have to look at what is happening in their life from zero to 12. And and when we talk about prevention, because I know that Matto and Level Up is massively about like, how do we prevent this? So much of that has to do with that connection from zero to 12. Because then when you get to adolescent stage and you're trying to deal with the why, like some of it is you're just managing the mess now. You're just managing all the stuff that these kids are doing. You're just trying to like, like I have a friend, I believe he's watching Officer Ness you know, um, they're just trying to make positive impacts with these kids and try to build connections with them. But they're already into a place where they've already established destructive patterns and behaviors. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to redirect them and teach them something different. It is much easier to influence a child from zero to 12 than it is to steer a rebellious teen. And I can speak to that. <laughs> um, uh, because then you're, you're trying to manage, you're trying to keep them from making a massive decision um, in that moment. And so, so I think that, I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of went on a rabbit trail there, but. We I love rabbit trails yeah. here and we all just learn so much from your story. So mm -hmm. you're right on track. Yeah. You know, this idea, a couple of things to, to mention the zero to 12 and how important it is. You know, that's why we talk about delay. Yep. You know, there's a, it's a developing brain and, you know, um, that's what happens, right? There, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed. That's yep. your decision-making center. So your the hormones and tennis shoes is a phrase that's used. It's There's all gas, there's no brakes. And, you know, at that age, you can't articulate. And and if you've got any trauma in that, and, and that's a relative term, yeah. 
um, you know, there's a great book uh, about the body keeping score. It kind of, even though if you, you're not aware with it comes with you yeah. and then you're interacting with a substance that, that temporarily does something to make that change. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you get an explosive converse, you know, uh, situation. So, you know, so I think that helps us to understand a lot, you know, already from your journey. And I know for a lot of people on here, um, you know, hope is a thing. Yep. So, you know, a lot of treatment programs, it can be difficult to get success. So yep. tell us about Teen Challenge and, you know, where things started to shift for you. Yeah. So uh, all of my treatment up to the before Teen Challenge, it was again, it was here's some coping skills. Here's some tools. We want to teach you some tools to cope with your addiction. And, you know, here's some other alternatives that you need to. And it, there wasn't a lot of like heart change. You know, and the and the Bible says that um, that out of the heart flow flows every issue, and so when I went to Teen Challenge, and I'm, I'll never forget, I had a, a conversation with the director Mike Gilmartin, um, and he on the phone. I was in jail, and we're having a conversation about this program, and he's like, "Look, you already know a lot about drugs, like you're an addict. You are like this isn't a program that's going to teach you more about drugs." And he's like, you already understand addiction. Like you've been experiencing the results of this. And he said, this program is and it's, it has a Christian, you know, focus and emphasis. This program is teaching you how to take responsibility for what you can, how to give God what you can't take responsibility, like what you can't, what isn't yours to control and learn how to have a healthy relationship with yourself. And therefore, when you have that relationship with yourself and with others, it's going to lead to you being able to build a foundation, you know? And so for te for me, teen challenge, part of it was like the, especially the first few months was I was just dealing with one, all the repercussions of my decisions. Obviously there were legal repercussions. There were repercussions with my family I'd stolen. I'd lied. I, I, I had hurt. My grandmother, my grandmother was like praying for me such so consistently. She ended up passing from cancer while I was in Teen Challenge. And I totally just believe like my grandma prayed me into the kingdom. Like she just prayed me um, anyways. And so, but during that season, I had to like make amends. I had to call people. I had to work through stuff with my mom and my stepdad. And, and I had to separate myself from like the friends in my life that were really a massive part of my destruction. And, um, and I realized that that afterwards, like, dude, a friend is not going to feed your addiction. A friend is like someone who's going to challenge you to come out of that. And, and some of it, it was like misery, love, com loves company. Like some of it was, we were just using together and co trying to cope together and, but I had to get around different people. And so these men that, that I got around just guys that were going through what I was going through, but also like the, like the director, the counselors there, they almost became like fathers, mentors, um, and really just taught me what did it look like to, to live without drugs being my primary focus or without, and even I would say it this way, without myself being the primary focus, you know? And um, so I learned how to look to serving others. I learned how to, like, I feel like I found purpose. And for me personally, I feel like I was running from my purpose my entire childhood, adult, uh, adolescence. Like even my uncle was a pastor and I really felt like at a young age, like I was called to help people but I had no desire to be in ministry. And I was just like, no way, the, the black robes and the white collar and uh, no thank you. And, but like I surrendered to that kind of that purpose, like I need to figure out what this looks like. And, um, and so I really, it wasn't just about focusing on addiction, it was focusing on health. It was focusing on how do you, I mean, we took classes like uh, anger and personal rights. Like, how do you deal with your anger? And, you know, I still remember to this day, a personal right is a rule that I have made up for myself that I expect other people to follow. 
most of the offense that comes in my life comes when people violate my personal rights. Well, get over your personal rights, give them to God. Like it just learning different things like that, dealing with the pain, like dealing with the, the, the stuff that had happened in my childhood, dealing with the conflict with my parents. And, and for me personally, it was also just like spending a lot of time with the Lord and getting to know him. Um, not in a like Sunday school way, but like, man, God is real and, and he speaks and he, he comforts and he heals the brokenhearted. And just like that reality, just that love, like changed everything. So it's a combination from love from these guys that were pouring into me and in the camaraderie of like some of my best friends are guys that I graduated the program with. Um, knowing like we can do this together, we're better together. And then also um, just that vision of what could life look like, you know, if I can get free from this. You know, it's a really powerful thing. I, I think it, it has come up on a few of our discussions is that once you, you're you with people that understand you and, you know, some things kind of get said to you a few times, it's like it just takes a while to click. Yeah. But it's got to be a, almost like an immersive experience. 100%. And then it all makes sense. And I think for some of us that are trying to figure out what's the best thing we can do to delay, decrease, and defeat addiction, you know, that certainly is some key takeaways for us because it's like we got to create, we got to take responsibility to build the scenario around someone that they're around people that can understand them, that can support to them, that can speak positivity in their life. Because I think one sort of central theme too, you've kind of shared with us is the beliefs that you had. Yeah. And you've been carrying those around and kind of just you're burning neurological grooves. Yep. And then you get to a place to say, oh, these, these grooves could look different. Yep. There, there can be new inputs into this software. Yeah, I think a huge thing, and I use this illustration, is like you look at like a name tag, right? And and there's a, things that we have, like ideas that we have come to believe about ourselves or about others and even about God. And a lot of times there'll be pretty big events in our life from zero to 12 or whatever. And for, in my case, it was like zero to three. And we can't help but like name those situations or, or like name ourselves. Like for me, I had like something that I was speaking and believing over my life was I am not important enough for my father to be engaged in my childhood. So what is wrong? So just like naming, like there, I must not be worth something, you know, like I must be worthless. And that was like, in like confronting that belief, when I, when I came to Teen Challenge and recognizing that is not true, that was a lie. And in even just like res respect to all the folks in the addiction field, this isn't like a, a like a, a dog on them or anything like that. But even the, the psychologist being like, you're going to be this your whole life. Whatever, dude, like, like, who are you? You're not God, you know, and, and it isn't, and again, it's not like, it isn't that there isn't, truth in the sense of but it was a partial truth like it was a partial truth like yes i needed to learn skills but that wasn't my focus wasn't stop being an addict my focus needed to be get healthy as as an individual and get a vision and a purpose for your life and that really that's that was that was key well, that's something, I mean, I think we can all take away from too, is the power of labels, Yeah, you know, and, and those brand you, you yeah. know, as somebody that came through the, the school system as a dyslexic, I mean, the beliefs that I carried around for years, you know, and I, I can relate to that. Once you get a label when you're young, it just, it seeps in there and it's really difficult yes. to unnerve that. Well, you are doing incredible work. You know, you, you've gone through this experience and it's so wonderful to hear somebody articulate it so well and talk about, you know, how you've, you've healed. And there's this, you know, um, I think uh, sometimes cliches are, are cliches because they're true, um, but that healed people heal people, right? Yeah, yeah. Like just like hurt people. Hurt. So tell us, you know, your principles and how you do this because you've taken all of this and on a daily basis, I mean, we're all watching you in this community help other people. You know, people are finding hope. They're taking steps. They're moving in the right direction. Yeah. It's not always easy, but you know, how do you, how do you, do you have some principles or a way that we can kind of look at relationships and build them? Yeah. Well, fast forward a little bit, like uh, share, just I'll share 
what happened after Teen Challenge. Shout out to my lovely wife who's watching right now. Uh, in August, we'll be married 20 years. But uh, right after Teen Challenge, I moved up to the Fargo-Moorhead area, went to school. Uh, I think they had a slide about I went to master's commission. I love this. The slide says I earned a master's of commission. I would have loved to do that. No, I, I went through master's commission um, and got some ministry training, learned like about different areas of ministry, met my, my wife in, during that time. We got married. We have now we have four beautiful kids. We have four biological kids and then two foster kids. And um, and life has been a journey. I went back and worked at Teen Challenge for eight and a half years, the program that I graduated from. And then out of that was felt led to come back to the Fargo Moorhead area and start a church. And so we started a church and 2014 and um and really kind of with the heart and the focus and the vision of if you're on church de church if you don't have like a positive uh thought about christianity or um you know or you're not connected to your purpose and it isn't just like oh it's a church for everyone like i think it's like a, it's a church for people that are seeking purpose and seeking kind of community some of the things that were pivotal in changing my life like that's what we're about and, and also being like you said like having an actual impact in our city um is really a huge value for us and um but so that's where we're at right now and and is one other kind of interesting stat is that my dad my biological dad had four kids from four different women and was never married for longer than you know, um, two years, three years. And, you know, uh, that isn't like a diss on my dad. He's passed now, but I don't know that he actually had like the tools to be a dad or to be a father or to be a husband. And so when we talk about principles and we talk about like you, I look at my life now and I'm like, like today I got a call and I was so honored, but like the, there was a police officer um, that nominated me to be on, on the board of badges of unity. And, and I'm like, dude, I was, they were chasing me in high school, you know, like, and um, so it's so awesome, like to come full circle and to, and to feel like a, a, a valued member of our city and to feel like we could give back as a church and, and even to feel like, man, collectively I can, we can cast vision to our congregation to say like, dude, we can do more together. We can be better together. Uh, but going back to like principles that would maybe help parents, maybe you're a parent or, or you are working in the field of helping people with addiction. Um, and maybe this will be something that adds value to you that you can share with other people that are struggling. Just a, a few things. I, I don't think we can undervalue that zero to 12. Um, I just, if we, if we want to talk about delay or prevention, I mean, for me, the, the, the first like three years in a kid's life is so, and, and we live in a society where divorce is huge and, and a lot of single moms, a lot of sing, shout out to the single moms and single dads, a lot of grandmas, grandpas, aunties, uncles, um, you know, right here in our, our state, in our region, I think the number one Pine Ridge Reservation has the number one, um, it's, a, it's the highest community in the nation where someone besides parents are raising their kids. It's like 90% of kids that are born there are raised by grandma, grandpa, auntie, or other family members. That is a big problem. We wonder why like addiction is rampant in, in places like that. You know, those kids are looking for, for help. And so, so I think you, you can't undervalue connecting and that's why, you know, some of what level up and Matto does is huge because, um, like building connections with kids that don't have a connection. Um, so that's one thing empowering parents. I think sometimes parents don't know parents or caregivers, or, uh, they don't know how to connect with their kid. And I just want to speak to that for a minute. I got, I brought like one of my son's piggy banks. Um, <laughs> so this is a, uh, it's not, it's like, it's a monkey, but so it's like a monkey bank, but like you can see the slot in the back there for, 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 and it's got like, 
it's got some money in there. So I think as, as parents, sometimes we're like, man, you want to teach your kids about financial security, right? Like saving will bring security. If you can, it's something that you can fall back on. It's something that when you keep putting in money into this, then, and you keep saving it and you don't spend it, you know, later on in life, if you have that same mentality, you can put money into investments and you could put money into and you can build on something, put money into your retirement so that later you can have financial security. It's a great principle to teach kids. But I think that sometimes like as parents, we're like, um, we focus on in our, our society is a very results based society, like get great grades in school, perform in sports, do all these things. And, and so we're, we're, we're like, we're kind of like, that's how we, that's how you succeed. But what about like, if, if our kid's heart was like this bank, right. And, and if we think like as a caregiver um, and I don't want to just say parents because it doesn't always, it's not always that way. Like you're, sometimes you're raising kids that aren't yours. Um, but so like as a caregiver, um, our primary role is to deposit more into this bank and deposit more into this heart than it is to take away because the world and, and they're going to, things are going to get taken away in labels that are put over them. Uh, tra tragic experiences that happen in school, uh, things that happen in their own childhood. There's going to be a lot of withdrawals. Hmm. Like, and I think that, that the default is withdrawals. Like every day hmm. there's things that are withdrawing from your own security that are withdrawing from your own emotional health, the war within like things that you say to yourself, things that you're hearing from other people. I mean, turning on the news and just having to deal with like the, the craziness that's happening in our world. And so there's constant withdrawals coming from this. If we can have the idea that man, every kid that's in our care from zero to 12, you know, we're putting daily deposits in their hearts so that by the time that they're 12 and this is cause this is what happens. Like with my kids, my goal with my kids, the goal with my kids is for them not to be addicts. That's not the goal. That's not the goal. The goal with my kids is for them when they are presented with that decision of, am I going to use, I want them to go, I don't need that. I don't, I don't, why? Because I already, like my heart is already secure. Oh, if someone says, well, you need this is so, you know, my youngest daughter's Kenzie, Kenzie, you, whoa, you got to do this. It's so good. It's so fun. I don't need that. I don't, I don't want that. They, they're healthy enough so that when they're presented with something that they know is not going to benefit their lives, it's easy for them. Why? Because there's, there's a surplus here. Their heart is confident and strong and, and, and because of those daily deposits that I've made as their dad. And I want to say this too, because that's a very subjective, like, oh yeah, make, make daily deposits. That sounds great. Right. But I actually think that you have to be really intentional at knowing because all four of my kids will now six, they receive love differently. So like how I, how I deposit in one, like one is like this big, she loves words of affirmation. She, yeah, I got to tell her stuff every day. But the other one, like my wife, she can testify to this. She doesn't care what you say. How much time have you spent with me? How much, you know, and so I have to be intentional about spending time. And so like you can, in the, the five love languages is a fantastic way. Highly recommend assessing your kid's ability to receive love because sometimes we think that we're giving love our way but we need to learn how to give kids the love that in the way that they receive. And so, um, so that's another really like really key pivotal thing. I've got one more. I can keep going. You got a question or not? No, okay. keep going. Well, right. we got, we, we're learning from you. So this isn't about, this is my last questions. kind of really big principle. And when I talked about uh, a society that's really uh, performance driven, um, I think sometimes parents struggle, caregivers, they struggle with the tension of we have to have expectations for our kids. We've got to have rules. We've got to have boundaries and, bo and boundaries are great and rules are great. 
but rules without relationship leads to rebellion. Um, like I'm going to say that again, cause I'm going to say it again for the folks in the back, like rules without relationship leads to rebellion. If you're, if you have rules, but your kids don't know that you adore them, they're going to rebel. Like they just will. And, and, and also some of you are like, I was, I was doing all these things. Like you can do everything and your kids can still rebel. And, and just for some encouragement for like, God was a perfect father and his kids still rebelled. Um, like it just like rebellion sometimes happens and we just have to deal with the consequences of that. Anyways, that's a separate sermon. Um, but no, I, I think that teaching our kids to fail, like is huge when we live in this performance-based society and we're always like, Hey, the A is the goal. Get the A in class, get the 4.0, get the best track time and in, in when you're competing like i i mean i'm i'm like that i i had the privilege of coaching my sons with football we don't play to lose we play to win like I, and there's nothing wrong with that like it's good to play to win it's good to like compete it's good to those are all things that think it's like part of healthy development it's but what happens when they don't get the a what happens when they lie to your face what happens when they don't do what you say. You know, what happens when, when they get pregnant? You know, what, what happens when, like, is your home, is our environment a place where, and I'm not saying that you can't be disappointed or that you can't be frustrated or you need, you're a real human with real emotions, but don't label, don't put like your kid, our kids, they make momentary they, they make decisions in the moment and don't decide in a moment what this child does or what this teen does and say, you're going to do this your whole life or look at what you've done. And like, no, man, shame is not a motivator. And, and I think that like just saying and realizing like, Hey, you failed. You, 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 you made a, you made a mistake. Here's what you do when you make a mistake. You go, Hey, I shouldn't have done that. And, but you also don't like, don't own that. Like what you, it's what you did. It's not who you are. Like you made a bad choice, but that's not, that doesn't have to be who you are. In fact, a lot of times when I'm correcting my kids, I'm like, this isn't who you are. Like, like it's what you did. Like, like, and I'll, I use the, my last name. I'm like, you're Lynn. We don't do that. You're better than that. We don't do that. Like there's more for you. And so leading with like vision instead of like shame, and, and that's tough guys, because, because our whole society is kind of built around shame and built around like you're, you need to do more. You need to get more. You need to have more money. You need to have the, the bigger house you need, you know, and you're not something until you get all these things. That's a lie, man. You're some, you're, you are beautiful and you are created in God's image and you have value and you have worth and you don't have to do anything to earn that. And that security, that sense of security, man, that's what kids flourish in that. Like, that's what, that's what changed my life. And I'm 41 and I need that every day. Like I still need that sense of security and that sense of acceptance and knowing I don't have to work for approval. I can work from approval. I don't have anything to prove, you know? Um, I think that's huge. And I think that we'll see, I think that if we really understand that our homes are safe and that our kids are going to fail and we're going to teach them how to fail and how to fail gracefully and not to stay there, but to get back up. I think that will, that would be huge. And, and uh, one last thing with that caregivers, the best way that you can teach your kids to fail is when you fail, take ownership. You're going to make a mistake with your kids. You're going to get too upset. You're going to get mad. Apologize to them. You need to apologize. Hey, I apologize. Mom shouldn't have, she got a little cranky, you know, she didn't have her coffee yet. Like, like just apologize. Hey, I shouldn't have done that. I'm, I'm sorry about that. And, and I can do better. And, you know, when for me with our home, if I'm upset with my wife and my kids see that, you know, and I, I'll apologize to my wife in front of my kids, or sometimes I'll have family meeting. Hey, you know what? Dad should not have done that. You know, that wasn't a good example. I'm sorry about that. So 
That is incredibly positive. And I think we're, we'll all take and cherish this metaphor of the bank and that we can take responsibility both in, in our actions and what we're doing and bringing people together to say sorry and demonstrating this, but also the way that we live models for all of our children or those youth in our care. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's something we can really take. Um, you know, I, do we have a do we have a question specifically um, here? Just want to ask you from a viewer. Uh, when you talk about the zero to twelve, this is kind of new for a lot of us that are listening today. Uh, where do you see the most prevention education to be? Is it on parents? Is it in the school system? Is it both? Kind of what age? You got any sort of parameters? Just uh, when you think about you know um, working with zero to twelve. I mean, I think the uh, home is the best place like evaluating the rhythms and the culture of your home every every organization including a home has a culture what's the culture of your home is it safe is it is it a place like even now like our kids are or teens and you know pre-covid we want our place our our teens to want to bring kids over to their house you know to our house like we want we want our home to be a place that's inviting and and so like, but that zero to 12, like making sure you're evaluating the culture of your home. And sometimes that's like self-evaluation, like, man, I've got some rhythms in my heart that don't make our home self healthy. And so getting help for that, addressing that is huge. Um, as far as like, you asked that great question, by the way, the, the kids, is it on the education system? Here's my thought about that. Um, the education system and my wife and I have the privilege of of working with educators and working with we were, our church adopted a school and we we get to kind of talk with them and and it's so fun but let me just tell you the education system is drowning because they are trying to meet all of these other needs physical emotional um and trying to educate kids on top of all these needs that they're in and some of it is they're these children don't know how to sit sit in class and learn, you know, like, because why? Cause they got stuff going on at home. That's, that's distracting them. So, so while I do think it is important for educators to be equipped and understand the importance, like some of our teachers, they have, they add tremendous value um, to our kids just by being present and being consistent. Um, so that's huge. However, I do think the primary influence when I think about this is in the home. Um, and we can partner with the schools and parents should be partnering with their teachers to, to have kind of a continual plan. And, but um, I personally think that it's the caregiver's responsibility because the focus of, of school is education. Like they're trying to learn basic skills to be able to read, write, you know, uh, function in life. But the, that emotional health, uh, I think primarily comes from the caregiver. Well, Travis, you know, you've taken us on quite a journey. You know, we've learned about the concept of the developing inner storm and the importance of zero to 12 and how that's going to have lasting impact uh, about that we can really change how, you know, uh, somebody who's going through addiction, how they may see themselves and the actions they take by surrounding them first by, you know, creating a relationship um, because otherwise the rules will just lead to rebellion. Yeah. And so reshaping that and then having these principles, you know, that are centered around this concept of a bank around them and that we're depositing into them regularly yeah. and that we can take responsibility for that in, in our homes and those in our care. Um, as we move to the last few minutes, closing thoughts, um, both on your journey and for um, all of us that uh, are joining today. Yeah, I think that just want to encourage you. I know most of us have somebody that's struggling with addiction or maybe it's a kid or maybe you yourself are struggling with addiction. I just want to encourage you. You're not defined by those moments in your life. You're defined by what, what are you going to do tomorrow and what are you going to do with what you've been given today? I mean, I feel like, um, again, shame is not a motivator. So like maybe you're hearing this and you're a parent and you're like, wow, there's some rhythms that need to change in our house or Maybe you're a caregiver uh, in in an, a nonprofit, or and you're like, man, I can I can do some things better. Just want to encourage you, like, run with that. Like, don't don't just feel that. Or sometimes we'll like feel like, oh, and then we don't do anything with that. And 
and find somebody to pour into. Maybe you're not a parent. There's so many different mentoring programs in our city. It's incredible. Like there's so many kids in our community that just need some, some love. And my, like a goal for me and my, I want more, I want, yep. This is my primary responsibility. This is my job <laughs> in my home, but I want to find as many people as I can and expose my kids that are going to also, you know, pour into their lives. So for us, that's church. It's, it's connecting with it's teachers. It's, it's connecting with other adults that we know share our same vision and values that are going to pour into our kids. It's community. You know, and I know COVID, man, we got this plastic wall going on right now, but we've got to learn how to get our kids into community and how to really um, stop making excuses and just really like, come, let's, if we collectively decide together that we're going to, and that's why I love the vision of, of these three organizations. If we decide together that we're going to, we're going to make a difference and it might be one kid at a time. Um, I just, I do believe that, that those stats are going to change. Well, yeah. And, you know, if we, if we follow the principles you've given us and, and, you know, um, you've given us a lot to take with us. So thank you so much. But this, um, you know, zero 12. And then, you know, after that, though, having the belief that a positive future is possible, that we're more interested, not in the labels, but yeah. laying a path forward. And I think, you know, you, you've encouraged and you've enlightened and you've given us a lot, Travis. So Thanks. thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Seriously, this is such a joy. It's so fun. Thank you. Well, it's absolute delight to have you and, and everybody that's on. Just a couple of things uh, we want to let you know is uh, Giving Heart Stays coming up February 11th. Um, it's in the chat, um, but, you know, consider Matto Foundation yes. and help us to fight addiction. Let's come together. We're going to get a tackle box in the hands of parents and teachers. And it's going to include some of the things that Travis is talking about. We're going to do our best to help. Let's delay, let's decrease, and let's defeat addiction together. Everyone, um, we're so glad that you joined us um, and that you'll consider giving Heart Stay. Mark your calendars for our next webinar. Um, it's going to be on opido op opioids and overdose with Robin Lichty Saul. And so that's going to be Thursday, March 4th at noon. Um, so you'll want to mark your calendar to attend there or click the link in the chat. Um, or in the post uh, to sign up for that. Um, with that, we appreciate each and every one of you. We applaud your work. We encourage you. Yes. We're here alongside you. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks.